Hi there and welcome new or regular listeners. Thank you for tuning in. This is Red Ice Creations Radio and I am your host Henrik Palmgren. Today we are going to dive into the topics of Gnosticism, sacred ecology, the archons, religion, belief and uh, much more. We have John Lash with us on the line and uh, we're going to talk about his book Not in His Image, Gnostic Visions, Sacred Ecology and the Future of Belief. Uh, John's website that you need to take a look at is metahistory.org. That's an excellent and vast resource with uh, tons of articles for you to explore further into these topics. So uh, it's a pleasure to have John Lash with us here today. Hi, John. Welcome to Red Eyes Creations Radio. Yes, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. It's excellent to have you here. I've been looking forward to this program for a long time, so it's great to, to have you on here. Um, you know, I would like to begin to, to, I guess, talk a little bit about um, Gnosticism and your interest in the subject. Uh, uh, I guess the, the best place to start is to just, um, you know, ask what got you started in the first place uh, into this subject. Well, I'll give you the, uh, the clue. You know how life is. It, it gives us these clues which uh, are not uh, so clear at the beginning, but then if we follow those clues in the course of life, they sometimes lead us into deep, into deep areas. When I was about, I think, 16 or 17, I was working uh, at a, for a summer job somewhere in in, uh, in the United States and around New York, uh, working as a waiter in a summer resort, and uh, always looking for things to read. And I happened to come across these books, which belong to the Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell, and these were books that were quite popular in the, in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. Lawrence Durrell was a British novelist, and it turns out that Durrell, D-U-R-R-E-L-L, who was a, a close friend of Henry Miller, mm-hmm. uh, was interested in some esoteric matters, such as the Kabbalah and Gnosticism. Well, I was just a country kid. I, I grew up in a small town in, in French of Maine, a little fishing village, very much... Uh, of the kind of fishing villages that you have, you know, in Sweden and Norway. Sure. That part of the world, a little village of, of eight or nine hundred people. I had no uh, exposure to es- esoterics or Gnosticism in that world. But by coming across these novels of Lawrence Durrell, uh, called the Alexander Quartet, he spoke about Gnosticism and the Gnostics, and it, it intrigued me terribly although I know nothing about it. Sure. So then over the years, I had uh, I explored it more, and I eventually, uh, by the time I was in my mid-20s, was, was deeply into uh, the texts and the mythology. Hmm. Interesting. So um, how long have you been, been writing yourself on the subject? I don't know what, which, uh, not in its image, your, your, I guess that's your latest book. Uh, which, is that your first one or third no, one? No, it's my last. My most recent book, it came out November of 2006, mm-hmm. and behind Not in His Image, there was about 10 years, 1996 to 2006, mm-hmm. of intense research on the Gnostic texts. Here in uh, Belgium, uh, near to Brussels, where I live sometimes, uh, there is a university called the Catholic University of Leuven, or mm-hmm. Louvain. Sure. Yeah, it's one of the oldest uh, universities in Europe. It's a humanistic, it was a humanistic center. It's connected with Erasmus, the famous uh, philosopher. And it so happens that at the University of Louvain, although it's very Catholic, there is a whole team of Gnostic scholars, experts on Gnosticism Hmm. and the Coptic language, and also, it it so happens, experts on the the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ah. So I spent a good deal of time uh, doing my research there, I wrote about five drafts of Not in His Image before the one that uh, is printed now. So I had ten years of intense study, and then before that, I, I really have been involved with Gnosticism uh, since my mid-twenties, so it's really been a lifetime effort. I understand, yeah, definitely fascinating. You know, I would like to talk, get into and talk a little more about, about the book here, uh, and I guess we could begin with the title itself, uh, Not in His Image. Now, you know, is that intended to scare the Christians away or to make them pick up the book? Well, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, they may choose to uh, run away from it, or they may choose to pick up the book and to 
consider why someone would say that we are not made in God's image, which is what I'm saying. Mm. I'm saying that the story we're told, which comes from the Bible, Christian Bible, and the belief that we are uh, in the Western Christian world, the belief that is given to us that humanity is somehow made in the image of the Creator, which is a male deity, Jehovah, is not so. It is not true. And what I do in my book is I expose that belief as a false belief. And I use Gnosticism because the Gnostic texts contain many points which uh, argue against patriarchy, against Christian religion, and precisely against that concept that we are made in the image of a Father God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when we, when we talk about uh, the Gnostic text, is this the bulk of this? Is this that was found uh, in, in Qumran, um, the, the Nag Hammadi library, or is there any other sources <coughs> excuse me, from outside there? Well, the sources <laughs> are of two kinds, Henrik. There are the Coptic texts, written in the Coptic language, that mm -hmm. were found not at Qumran, that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Okay. The Coptic texts were found at Nag Hammadi in Egypt in the first week of December 1945, mm. which happens to be exactly when I was born. And <laughs> they are the practically the only surviving originals that we have. I don't really think they even are originals, but they are close to originals. So we rely very strongly on those, and there are about 53 documents in there, but only about 30 of them are of any value. The others are very fragmentary and so forth. Additional to that, there are, the, there are three other Coptic documents that were discovered before Nag Hammadi, mm -hmm. uh, such as the Bruce Codex, the Askew Codex, and so forth. And then there are a number of Greek language works which contain Gnostic teachings. But all in all, I have to tell you, it's a pretty pitiful handful of material. Hmm. The reason why, and I, I, I want to emphasize this to all the listeners, the reason why we have so little of the original Gnostic material is not by accident, and it is not because of the damage of time and having these, these manuscripts and texts and scrolls being just rotting away, mm. it is because they were systematically destroyed over a camp in a campaign that lasted hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So there's very little that remains. But the Nag Hammadi documents that were discovered in Egypt are really the principal focus right now of, of Gnostic studies. Understand. Um, so have they all been fully translated? And if so, who has done the translation on these things? Shortly after the Nag Hammadi uh, documents were found in 1945, their importance was recognized. And uh, sometime later, as I explain in my book, uh, a team of scholars from a theological college in California, Claremont College, undertook to do the translations. And this team was led by a man named James Robertson. And so what they produced, I think it was around 1976, was the so-called Nag Hammadi Library in English. Mm -hmm. And this is the principal book that, that your readers would go out or anyone would go out and buy in a bookstore to read the Coptic literature. There have also been other, uh, other translations by other scholars, mm -hmm. but that's the primary translation. There's only one in English. There's only one in French. Uh, I don't know if it's been translated into into Swedish. I'm sure it has been into, into German and other languages. Mm. I must warn, however, that these translations are, are atrocious. Really? They're very bad. Uh, some, to some extent, if you look, if you go into a bookstore, I would advise you to look through the Nag Hammadi Library in English before you buy it. <laughs> okay. Because a great deal of it is incomprehensible. It's, it's gibberish. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't really hang together uh, at all. Uh, so that is a difficult thing for those people who want to approach uh, Gnosticism. I, I must warn you that it, it's not an easy subject. 
And how did you kind of, uh, you know, manage to to differ between the, the versions, and, and what one do you consider to be a good one for people to go into? I don't, I don't consider any of them to be really good. I mean, there are there's another translation by a scholar called uh, uh, Leighton, which is not particularly good either. I'll tell you what the problem is, mm. Henrik. Uh, there are two problems basically. One is that these Coptic texts that we're relying on to know about Gnosticism were written in Coptic, which is not really a, a true language. It's a language that was invented around 100 uh, B.C. Mm -hmm. in order to translate hieroglyphics into a kind of into another into a kind of shorthand. In other words, at that time in Egypt, the whole civilization and religious culture of Egypt had declined. And there were fewer and fewer priests who could read hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it became necessary to convert hieroglyphics into another language. And Coptic was invented for that purpose. It's not a genuine language. It's, it's very uh, awkward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does not express profound philosophical ideas. The constructions are very uh, complicated. And even the scholars who are translating these Coptic texts point out that they're full of grammatical errors, they are difficult to understand, uh, the, the grammar is, is, uh, uh, is complex and confusing. So that's the first part of the problem. We have these Gnostic texts written in a language that is not ideal hmm. for transmitting profound or mystical ideas. Sure. Okay? Yeah. The second problem is one that I address in the preface of my book, not in his image. I point out in there that the prominent Gnostic scholars today, such as this woman Elaine Pagels, and your listeners may have heard of her because she wrote the Gnostic Gospels, mm -hmm. are religious scholars. They're, they have positions in universities. They're deeply respected. They've studied the Coptic language. They've probably been to Egypt and all that. But there is one thing that they are not. They are not practicing mystics. Mm. So I would ask you, how can someone who is not a practicing mystic translate mystical literature? Well, obviously it's going to be very difficult to understand and, uh, and do the translation uh, correctly, you know. It is. They're just going to be guessing. Sure. You know, you would expect, if someone writes a book about golf, you would expect that they play golf. Sure. And that they know the, they know the game. If someone writes a book about Antarctica, the least that you expect is that they went to Antarctica or at and least, they, mm -hmm. they spent some time there. But when you read the books, and there are many, many of them now, mm -hmm. as you know, because Gnosticism has become widely discussed sure. to some extent because of the Da Vinci Code, you know. Yeah. Uh, when you read these books by these experts, I have to tell you, they are they may be expert scholars, but they are handling mystical and esoteric material, and they have no experience of that field. Hmm. And so it, it, it's very, very difficult for them to translate correctly what they're seeing. Uh, can you read uh, the, the language yourself? Have you done your own translation? How, how did you been able to kind of uh, root out the information from these texts? Well, I studied the Nag Hammadi Library and all the related literature that is, in, as I said, that's not in Coptic for about 25 years before I started to tackle the Coptic. And fortunately, no, I am not proficient in Coptic. I am not a Coptic scholar. I cannot read Coptic fluently. However, I did spend a lot of time at the University of Leuven. I did consult there with experts in the Coptic language. I used the Coptic dictionaries, which are available there, and I am able, in a way, to kind of crawl through it if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. I can crawl through it. Also, I should point out that Coptic, which is an invented language, borrows its words from Greek. And so yeah. about yeah. one in every four words in the Coptic language is actually just a Greek word. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> And I know Greek fairly well. So I am able to piece together, uh, and what I have done is I have taken the translations that are available from the experts, and the recognized scholars. And in some cases, I have reworked them. But I cannot translate. If you give me a, a paragraph of Coptic, I can't translate it right out. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I can't do that. But I have looked at the language carefully, and I've examined the words and the structure. And in that in, in doing that, I've taken the liberty to modify some of the translations that uh, are available. Right, right. So, I mean, you said that there weren't too many of, of these documents, so to speak, around. Um, and I guess that you've been going through uh, all or most of them then. And uh, if so, is there any kind of easy way to encapsulate what the what the main idea or, or basic message of these texts are? Yes, that's what I've very much tried to do. Uh, I've tried to sort of uh, distill the message and to uh, get to, say, the essential points of the message. Uh, and as you know, Metahistory Org contains many articles which are dedicated to that very uh, aim. Yeah. In fact, there's, for instance, if you look, go to the site guide where you have all the things I've written in alphabetical order, there's an essay called Approaching Gnosticism in which I sort of, it's sort of the, which I try to introduce people to it and explain what are the, the central ideas of Gnosticism. And there are about uh, three or four central themes in the essential Gnostic wisdom. Interesting. And, uh, you know, one thing I want to kind of dive into a little bit is to talk about if... You know, the, the, let's talk about the three main uh, mainstream religions, so to speak, from the uh, Abrahamic tradition: Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Uh, right. Do you think that your your book is is very, or is it very threatening to these these structures, these religions? Well, in some respects, I would consider it might be a death blow to those religions. Hmm. <laughs> some people have actually told me uh, I've I've gotten some responses to my book people have written to me on the site some people have actually told me that it completely wiped out the last bit of trust and faith they had in those abrahamic religions mm. and allowed them to completely liberate themselves from those belief systems what uh, mm, i'll give yeah. you an example of what i mean henrik it mm. can be a, there are several aspects to that but let me give you one example sure All three of the Abrahamic religions, of course, as people know today, I think most people understand, are called Abrahamic because they come from the same root. The Bible tells us about the patriarch Abraham. And, of course, the Jews recognize Abraham, the Christians, and the Muslims all recognize him as kind of the father of their belief systems. Right. Now, even though these three belief systems have various differences, when you get to the core of them, there are fundamental points which are identical and all of these three religions are what I call redeemer religions that is to say they all teach that humanity needs a redeemer it needs a savior Mm -hmm. and that savior is not a human being but is more or less of a superhuman kind of being who comes to earth and performs some act to save humanity. In the, in the, uh, in the, to the Hebrews, that Savior is called the Messiah. Mm-hmm. To the Christians, that Savior is the unique person, as you know, Jesus Christ. Sure. And to the Muslims, that Savior is uh, various imams and various figures that they, male figures that they, uh, or, or Muhammad the Prophet, male figures that they hold as uh, messengers of God. Right. Okay? Right. So all of that stuff, which we are taught in, in a Christian upbringing, belongs to what I call the Redeemer Complex. We are told that our lives, spiritually, depend upon this Redeemer who comes and saves us and changes the human condition. Uh, what I show in my book is that that Redeemer Complex uh, is a false belief system, and that the original Gnostics, who were pagans, uh, actually opposed and fought against that belief system. And that's one of the reasons why they were eliminated by the Christians. Hmm. So, what you're saying here also is that this, because of the nature of, of how these three mainstream, sort of, so to speak, religions uh, are structured around this concept, um, that this is also... Could, could we say that this is also 
mm, the root cause for why things today are the way they are so bad, so to speak, the, that this uh, basic philosophy or idea that someone else from outside is always going to come and save us, that we ourselves can't do it. Is that correct? Absolutely. I trace the in my book the the development of this belief system, and I point out where this belief system has brought us today. The the uh, the fact that a great part of humanity, you know, how many people embrace these three religions, you know, mm. billions, right? Yeah. The fact that a great part of humanity make themselves dependent on this external savior figure or the greater part of humanity believe that the world is ruled and judged by what I call an off-planet Father God has brought humanity, it has ruined our own moral capacities, it has destroyed our imagination, and it has undermined our capacity to be responsible for our own evolution. Hmm. That's basically, as you know, the argument in my book. Hmm. So would you say that this is because of manipulation or is this because of something more psychological in nature or even some kind of uh, well actually manipulation on on a deeper level e either biological or psychological then level on 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 humanity or on humans well it's a combination of a couple of things henrik i, I think there is a big factor of manipulation in there uh, i'll give you an example which i think is fairly obvious uh, everyone knows that the united states was supposed to have been founded on a division of church and state, you know, mm -hmm. on a division of government and religion. As a matter of fact, the founding fathers of America had a, had a difficult time doing that. They wanted to separate religion and government, but the word God is, of course, mentioned in the Constitution and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, uh, presidents of the United States have been religious men, they've been Christians, but they haven't necessarily made a big point of that. However, look at George Bush, and yeah. look at the way that he has used religion and Christianity as part of his political agenda. Sure. Okay? Yeah. So that's a very clear example of how this, this belief system can be used to manipulate people, to make them afraid, and to say, well... You're afraid, but let your government take care of you, and don't forget, God is on our side. Mm. You know, mm. it sounds terribly simplistic, but it works for a lot of people. So there is a factor of of, uh, of manipulation, and not just on a superficial level. I think it, it goes into some very weird things. Mm. On the other hand, though, I would add that I think part of the problem comes from human nature. You know, we are a vulnerable species because... We have language and imagination, and we're very gullible. Hmm. Children will generally believe the stories that adults tell them. Why? Yeah. Because children haven't yet developed critical thinking, but right. they have very powerful imaginations. That's the nature of being a child, isn't it? Sure, sure. <laughs> and so the part of the problem is that in our species, with its imaginative faculties and its gift for language, and its need for stories is very vulnerable to accept the stories that are told to it until it reaches the point where it gains critical thinking. Mm. And uh, what what I see today, and which is very encouraging to me, is that in in the younger generation and in in people uh, like you and those who are who are uh, doing websites uh, uh, like yours, I see critical thinking. I see them saying, well, wait a minute, you know, are we going to buy this story? Sure. Are we going to go along with this belief? Mm. And uh, that's a but so we're in involved sort of in a battle here, you know. Yeah. The battle is to get back to the truth uh, and back to the truth of humanity and who we are and what the earth is. And in order to do that, we have to strip off a lot of the beliefs and stories that have been laid on us. So it's a, it's a problem that's uh, uh, intrinsic to human nature, I think. Mm. I hope I'm making myself clear on that. Definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm sure yeah. I'm following you there, right? Uh, you know, the question also is that, that arises, how come that this particular, I guess, religion or version of, of 
of the creation or, or however, however we want to term it have become so success, su- successful. What I'm, what I'm getting at is that there seems to be, you know, a lot of different creation stories out there. Of course, we, we should not forget that, you know, H- Hinduism and Buddhism, of course, is, you know, again, huge religions that also, That's right. you know, plays into this, of course. But if we just That's focus right. right now on Christianity, Islam and Judaism, uh, is there anything in your kind of uh, work that hints t- towards why these have become so successful, so to speak? Absolutely, absolutely. That's a that's a difficult question you raise. It's a question that comes up in in our minds. We can't avoid it, uh, and I I certainly can't answer it adequately in this interview. But I will say that my entire book is focused on answering that question. Mm. And basically, uh, what I say is that. Uh, in large measure, the Redeemer religion uh, of the Abrahamic uh, faith has succeeded because it has been imposed. It mm. has been imposed, and it still is imposed. It has been imposed by violence. It yeah. has been imposed by uh, brainwashing. It has been imposed by threats. And uh, we tend to forget today because uh, we don't necessarily... Uh, go to church and hear a preacher uh, telling us that we're going to be thrown into the fires of hell and burned and tortured if we don't obey the Ten Commandments. We think that's a bit ridiculous, maybe today. But as a matter of fact, that is a that has been enforced on people all around the world for very many centuries. So one of the reasons why that belief system has succeeded is because it has been uh, accompanied by uh, it, it has been implanted by violence. Mm. Um, and so, you know, and there are other reasons as well, but to get into them is a little more complicated. It has to do with what this matter that I call the victim-perpetrator mm. syndrome, the victim-perpetrator bond, which is described at length uh, in my book as well. Mm. Yeah, that sounds interesting. You know, wh- one thing that comes to mind also that you mentioned, uh, you know, brainwashing, uh, and, and the question is if there is kind of... Um, how should I put it? Something within the text itself, beyond the fact that you know, of course, it's a the Bible is a very. If we just talk about the Bible now, the uh, Christian faith, it's a very long uh, book. <laughs> There's so much information in there, and obviously, you know, it's 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 impossible um, to to keep track on it all, so to speak. And that's that's why, still, you know, almost what is it, 700 years later, we're still, you know, scholars are picking it apart and trying to understand it and so forth. So there's a lot of text in there, obviously. But uh, do you think there could be something within the language itself that actually makes people, uh, should I put it, actually, you know, uh, become more um, or manipulated, I should say, by the text itself in some way? Do you think that's well, that's the an case? excellent question, and my answer would be yes. And I can tell you exactly what, uh, what it is. Mm-hmm. Two things. First of all, Consider the, the, the beginning of it, because the, the power of the story in the Bible begins with a myth of creation, and it gets you, it gets you, gets into the human mind right at the beginning, because the story of the myth of creation and Genesis is a story about sin and guilt, mm. because we see the parent Adam and Eve who represent the human race, and we see them sinning, doing something, uh, disobeying God, and then we see them punished. Now, that story of sin and punishment and guilt lodges immediately in the human psyche. One of the things about human beings, and you don't have to be a psychologist to understand this, is that we are very susceptible to guilt. You see this every day in the manipulations of family relations, in the manipulations of politicians. Sure. If you want someone to do what you want, you make them feel guilty. Hmm. And then you can get them to do it. Hmm. So insofar as the, the founding myth of the Bible presents a story of guilt, it implants itself already into our psyche as a, as a brainwashing tool. Hmm. The second thing is that the main character of the Old Testament, and to a certain extent even the New Testament, the main character is not a human being, but a deity. Sure. Jehovah, Yahweh, the Father God. That is actually the main character of the Bible. And in the New Testament, a second character is added, 
which is Jesus Christ, who is the son of that deity, and in certain respects identified with him as well. Sure. Now, the way that Jehovah behaves in the Bible is classically the behavior of a schizophrenic. Hmm. That is to say, Jehovah promises his chosen people, the Jews, to treat them better than anyone else in the world, to favor them, and to reward them. And at the same time, he torments and tortures them. Hmm. This is very clear in the events that happen in the New, in the Old Testament. And so there you have the second factor, Henrik. The second factor is known to psychologists who study cults and cult literature. One of the secrets of a cult, of a cult leader, a cult guru, is that he will put his followers in a schizophrenic state. Hmm. He will tell them that they are, that they are special. He will give them special treatment, and then he will turn around and debase and humiliate them. This is a well-known psychological technique that occurs in cults. Right. Well, you find that very same technique operating in the text of the Bible. So those are two reasons, guilt and schizophrenic uh, behavior mm. are two very powerful tools for controlling the human mind, and, and they're inherent to the way the Bible works. And, and those who study mind control knows that uh, trauma is a huge, uh, you know, uh, technique, so to speak, in order to even shatter the, the shatter the mind or the the personality of of an individual. You know, indeed it is. Indeed it is. Trauma shatters the mind. We know that this that uh, there are evil people on the planet who study these things. There's MK Ultra. There's all the mind control experiments that have been going on for the last 50 years that are continuing now. And we're learning a little bit about them with the Freedom of Information Act hmm. that has released certain documents. We understand now that by subjecting someone to trauma and scaring them, then you can then break up their personality and you can control the fragments of their personality much more easily than you can control the whole person. And I guess one could say that the events that take place in, in our world today with, with, you know, we have minor traumas here and there all the time, either if, you know, we turn on the news or whatever, but if we really think about that, we could basically say that what is going on, in effect, is a form of mind control, but not the kind of mind control where you, you know, go into a dark room and get, uh, you know, subjected to electroshocks or whatnot, but a very kind of subtle psychological mind control. Exactly. I believe that is so today, and I believe that the the most ancient and long-term example we have of this mind control is in is the Bible. The Bible is a tool for social and spiritual control and manipulation. It is not a revelation of spirituality. I defy you to find in the Christian Bible, in the Old or New Testament, one single teaching about the nature of consciousness there's nothing about the nature of consciousness in the Bible. If you, if you would agree with me, or if you would go along with me, that a true spiritual teaching, a true spiritual philosophy, tells us something about consciousness, what consciousness is, and how it works, which is what Buddhism does, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then you would have to go and turn to the Bible and say, there's nothing spiritual in the Bible. It doesn't teach you about how the mind works doesn't teach about love, it, it presents a few platitudes about love, but it doesn't really teach anything. It's an actually a very powerful behavioral control tool, and it's the oldest tool, and it's still being used today. What do you think about the idea that have, has been laid forth, uh, you know, recently with the uh, uh, the gas movie and, and others? This goes way back, of course, to... Uh, uh, Acharya S. and uh, Jordan Maxwell and others have been studying this idea that um, the, the Christian version, so to speak, with Jesus and all this actually is based on a much older uh, religion, meaning that we can tie, tie it back even all the way back to Egypt and maybe further than that, uh, the sun god and all of this. Uh, there's many correlations between, uh, between ancient religions and the, the more modern one. What do you think about an idea like that? Well, I, you know, I'm a comparative mythologist. That's kind of been my role in life. So I've studied all the myths of different cultures and compared them. And uh, I agree with uh, 
the general view of the Zeitgeist film. There are, I think there are some inaccuracies in there, but I agree with the general view that there's hardly anything original in Christianity, and that the whole figure of Jesus Christ and the Savior born of a virgin on the winter solstice and so forth was stolen outright from a previously existing pagan uh, pagan uh, beliefs and pagan religions from the polytheistic religions of nature. I, I totally agree on that, but I add a, a point that the Zeitgeist movie doesn't make, and that is that even though Christianity and the figure of Jesus Christ was constructed from these pagan materials, it was constructed into something that has no equivalent in paganism. Hmm. There is no sacrificed redeemer in paganism. There is no such figure. Isn't there? If you look at it, the idea of the sacrificed redeemer, as, and we we started talking about this at the beginning of the talk, who is, uh, you know, whom we depend on for our salvation, uh, is a unique uh, element in the, in the Christian belief system. What about the, the Abrahamic belief system? Sure. What what about the the all the the crucified saviors, so to speak. I think there are people who have counted them and um, match up to like 13 or 16 or something like that and traces it back to, to older religions. I don't know, you're saying that that's not, not the case? or? Well, there may be crucified saviors. There may be images of crucified saviors in the pagan religions, but the pagan religions did not teach that the crucified saviors, be it Dionysus or Osiris or whatever, mm -hmm. were actually performing a deed that was going to uh, save or rescue the human race. Mm. That is not stated in those belief systems. That's the difference, you see. Mm. There's a similarity of the myths, and you have to be very careful about that, because mythical material is, is very tricky stuff. Right, right. There's, there, there's a similarity of the myths, but the message is entirely different. Mm. I know of no pagan, Egyptian, Scandinavian... Uh, Polynesian, uh, Aztec belief in a crucified Savior who dies for, for, for the love of the world in order to do something that, that helps humanity rescue itself from sin. Hmm. That, that idea is completely unique to the Abrahamic religions and is not found in the pagan religions, even though there are mythical parallels. You mentioned something that that I find very interesting, and I can't I cannot wrap my head around that idea. But many in many cases, I hear many Christians say that uh, you know, in order for basically you know save humanity, God demands a, a, a sacrifice, basically, um, and he you know he demands that some someone must be sacrificed, or or else you know all the humanity will be sacrificed. But now Jesus has stepped in. And he has taken the place of, of all, you know, all of that. And, and now we can only, all we have to do is just believe in Jesus Christ and then he will, you know, have, have taken on the role, so to speak, of being that sacrifice. But, you know, why, again, we go back to the idea that you expressed that, that this is a schizophrenic God, so to speak, Yahweh. That's uh, right. I mean, why does a God demand a sacrifice? What is the, is there a clear message about that in the Bible or anywhere else that you've been, you know, been, been able to find? No, no, Hendrik. This is the difficult thing, and this is where a scholar like me has to, you know, wear his brains out over years to try to get to the core of this, because the core of it, really, my friend, is insanity. Mm. It's really insane to believe that a God of love would demand sacrifice of any kind any kind whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so I delved in my book into why is this belief so powerful? Why do so many people accept this belief? You know, as you say, you can't get your head around it. It's very difficult to mm -hmm. get your head around it, my mm -hmm. friend. Believe me. Yeah. But I think that in my book, I believe, and it has to be judged by the people that read it, I believe that I have actually gotten to the dirty secret at the bottom of that whole belief system. Hmm. And that is about the glorification of the victim. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Uh, much yeah. to ponder upon, definitely. Lord Christ is the divine victim. Mm -hmm. And we are, can all be victims, can't we? Sure. We can all be victims. Life is not safe. Life is scary. Society can be dangerous. It can be uncertain. We can be victims. 
Women can be raped. Men can be raped. Uh, children can be molested. We can be robbed. Uh, we can be victims. And so we humans are faced with this question on a human level. How do I deal with victimhood? How, if it happens to me or if it happens to somebody else, how mm. do I deal with it? Mm. And, uh, and my point is we need to come to the solution to that question out of our own humanity. But that's not mm. what's been done. What's been done is we've been given a false solution to that question. Right. We've been given a solution that says, oh, wait, wait, there is a divine victim. And he was sent by God in order to save all of you from victim, victimization. Mm. Well, first of all, that's a lie. Nobody can save you from victimization. There is no guarantee that you will not be the victim of somebody or something. You could be murdered, you know? Sure. Any of us. And so it is in the human failure, this is how I would put it this way, to sum it up, the human failure to come to terms with victimhood and suffering has caused a pathology. And that pathology glorifies the victim and glorifies suffering. Mm -hmm. And that is the sick pathology of the Abrahamic religions. And we consequently also then identify with that uh, victim, so to speak. And we see maybe even a part of ourselves in him, meaning that we can see our own suffering, that this is almost a divine thing, or this is something that is, um, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, as you say, it's a, it's a virtue in that, right? Well, the virtue in that is that it, 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 it looks like a very good thing at first, because you could say, well, this divine victim, the figure of the divine victim who dies for our sins, allows us to handle our own suffering, right? Mm. It might look like a good thing, but when you look at it more closely, it's not a good thing at all. Because what it means is that we accept victimization. We allow it. We accept it. We, 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 we accept the belief that suffering has a redemptive value. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that sentence? Sure. Suffering has a redemptive value. Now, you asked me before a very good question, and everyone who's ever looked into this subject and, and investigated it uh, has encountered this, this fact that comes up in the Zeitgeist movie. Well, wait a minute. Jesus was a crucified Savior, but there were many uh, crucified God, but there were many other crucified gods, you know, so Jesus was taken from those other crucified gods. Mm. That's true. But what is not true is that in the pagan myths of the crucified gods, they do not claim that suffering has a redemptive value. Hmm. But Christianity claims that, so it means to say, your suffering will probably has a divine purpose. Hmm. <laughs> And that opens the door for some very, very evil manipulation. Well, it does. It opens the door for basically what I consider at this point to be uh, uh, secret societies within, you know, wrapped within the religious structure, basically to, um, well, slowly take control of of the planet itself, basically. And uh, and now, you know, all all of humanity is, is stuck between these different re belief systems that even you know, fight among themselves now in order to, you know, gain more ground, so to speak. I can't wait until your film is done. I've seen the trailer. I want to see the whole thing, <laughs> because I think there are quite a few parallels, strong parallels, between the scenario, your investigation, and my uh, analysis in my book. I agree with you that uh, if you can... Look at it this way. If you can affect people and manipulate them in their perception of suffering, then you can manipulate them totally. Hmm. If you can take away from them the responsibility to deal with their suffering, then you make them powerless. Yeah. And these are the two things that these hidden controllers are attempting to do. And they work through these religions. That's their cover. They use these religions as cover. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I and I should point out, you mentioned the the movie there that uh, Architects of Control is 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 uh, featured. Uh, you know, Michael Tsarin is featured in that, and then it's his brilliant scholarship that is uh, focused that we focus upon in the movie. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's that's how it is. Um, you know, I want to 
in, in the last few minutes here that we have left in the first segment, and then we're going to, to dive in uh, a little bit deeper and talk more about the the, the, the archons and, and the uh, basically ET connection, so to speak, uh, sure. to all the things that we have spoken about, and that is going to be fascinating. But I do want to talk a little bit about just the last few minutes here about sacred ecology. This is one of the phrases in your subtitle of your book, uh, what, what is it that you mean by, by sacred ecology? Can you, uh, you know, boil that down for us, so to speak, a little bit? Sure. Sacred ecology is the, is the system of values, it's the values that come from the awareness that the earth is a divine being, the earth is a sacred being, alive and intelligent. And that is actually what the Gnostics taught and what the Christians wanted to destroy. Because in the Abrahamic religions, we are given a different belief. We are told that the earth is the creation, the handiwork of a father god who is somewhere, who knows where, off planet, mm. <laughs> outer space, who knows where, of a male god alone creates the earth like an object, like a plate. But Gnostic mythology said, no, the earth is the transformation of a divine being, a feminine being, the goddess Sophia, which means wisdom. And so sacred ecology is our, is every individual's relationship to that divine being who is the intelligence of the earth. Mm, fascinating. And... Uh does, do, do you go anywhere into your scholarship? Because I know there's, a, if I'm right here, a, a connection between uh, e ecology, meaning that, uh, what do you call it, entheogens. Uh, there have been books yes. like uh, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by... Uh, That's right. Uh, oh, what was his name? By John Allegro. Right, 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 exactly. Do you go into that a little bit? Yes, I do, because a lot of my book is dedicated to a description. You know, my book is about Europe. Hmm. It's about the spiritual history of Europe and the tragedy of Europe, which includes Scandinavian countries as well. It's about the pagan mysteries of Europe, the great network of, of schools of pagan wisdom and shamanism that were destroyed and wiped out by the rise of Christianity. They just didn't fade out. They just didn't go away because Christianity was a better idea. They were violently suppressed. And what I show in these in my review of the mysteries, as they're called, uh, the, the spiritual uh, shamanic schools of ancient Europe, is that they used entheogenic practices in order to communicate with the living intelligence of the earth. So there is a huge entheogenic or psychedelic factor in uh, the story that I'm telling and in the new Gnosticism that I'm proposing. Hmm. Fascinating. You know, I want to... Uh pop out a last question here and this is you know regarding the idea that you know I basically want to ask you if you personally believe that the religious structure that is it is you know formed right now needs to be uh, removed taken apart broken down you know disintegrated basically is that the case yes i believe that if humanity is to survive not only physically, but if we are to preserve our, our humanity, the humanity in our hearts, mm. that which makes us human, we must absolutely uh, defy those religions and, and liberate ourselves. Some individuals must totally liberate themselves from those belief systems. And, and can you do that in any way without... I mean, this obviously is going to, you know you know, furious, <laughs> many people are going to be furious about this that are really very deep into the different religions uh, that we've been talking about here, and uh, especially then Christianity also. Um, is there a way to, to, you know, do that, go about breaking that down without causing, well, basically start a war, I guess. What, what, what's your idea about that? Well, who's going to start the war, you know? I think if there's going to be a war, the war is going to come from the Christians. They've been waging war on people who don't agree with their beliefs for a long time. Sure. They burned hundreds of thousands of shamans and witches in Europe. They destroyed the Gnostics. They murdered the Gnostics, destroyed their temples, burned their books. The Gnostics and the people who uh, adhere to the belief system that I, that I uh, propose, the belief system of Sophia and sacred ecology, they didn't, uh, they didn't destroy the Christians. They didn't make war on the Christians. So, 
uh, I think it's an ideological war. Sure. And I think it's a it's a it's a, a war of liberation for those people who see that Christianity and the Savior myth is sick, mm. and we have to heal ourselves from that sickness. But to to you know if if, if something new would come in and and take its place, so to speak. Uh, would the only way to do, and I mean, what I'm getting at here is I'm not in any way, you know, endorsing. I know what, endorsing, you, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, I'm not endorsing violence or anything like that. What I'm just, what I mean is just that, I mean, how the heck can can a religion disappear off the face of the planet without causing terrible conflict and upheaval? You know, it is going to cause terrible conflict and upheaval, and I think that what will replace that religion, what could replace that religion. Uh, will not take the form of religion. So it's not going to be a case of a new religion arising and, and going to war with the existing religions. Sure, sure. I think that the existing religions, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are going to destroy themselves. L- l- I, aren't they doing that a little bit already? They are doing it before our very eyes. I mean, sure. I don't think that's a prophetic statement, is it? No. No. I think they're going to destroy themselves by division, by confusion, by by religious hatred, by sectarian look look at the sunnis and the shiites in islam destroying each other sure and i think that the people who want to follow another path free of religion and to go into a high a higher spirituality which i call the mystical the mystical spirituality of the earth itself you might say go back into true paganism mm. animism the worship of the life force are going to just withdraw they're not going to get into a fight with those people there's no point in fighting with them they're nuts you know you can't argue with them they won't reason with you i see what you mean so so this could be a a, a, um, a way that, that we would go about this or or that you know basically people who are interested and want to find out more because of all the information that is available now are perhaps slowly going to you know walk away from the old structure and this going to transmute or transform into something new and in between there that doesn't mean that there will be any any kind of fighting going on, right? No, we don't have to fight them. They're their own worst enemies. But the other people who turn their backs on those belief systems and liberate themselves would then, I think, recognize each other. They'd be attracted to each other. They'd recognize each other and they'd form groups, kind of like cells, small groups. You know, it's not about creating a new institutional monolithic religion. It's more or less about uh, local... Uh, groups of people getting together and exploring a different kind of spirituality that is free of those of those beliefs, free of those of those path, of that pathology mm. of the victim and the perpetrator. Mm. Big challenge, but I think it's already happening, and I think it is happening. And and I'm sure that some of the people who are listening to this, while some may be screaming, you know, and wanting to come find me and burn me at the stake, sure. Uh, others may be nodding their heads and saying, well, maybe the guy is making some sense. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, exactly. I mean, in the end, uh, I mean, I, I'm for the idea that we should be able to come to our own conclusions and based on the information and material out there, we should uh, make up our own picture of the world. And I don't feel that we have been, um, they, so to speak, within quotes there, haven't been playing fair, meaning that there is a, an indoctrination process going on from, from, from day one when we're born into this system. And in order for us to make the, the correct picture of the world, we need to first actually break out from that. And if that means walking away from, you know, any kind of organized religion, so be it. That's, that's the case and that's my so viewpoint. Yeah. That's what it means. And many, many young people are doing it, you know. Sure. If you just even look on YouTube, which you know, may or not be a good example, but it is a social phenomenon. Sure. A great, a great. There's an enormous atheist movement on YouTube. There's an enormous movement of young people who are saying, "I don't buy it." You know, mm. I'm not, I'm not going a step further with any of these beliefs. Hmm. So I think that the, this is the moment now for that division to occur. But I don't see the people who, who uh, liberate themselves from those religions as as getting into. Uh, getting into trouble with the people. I, I see them as just, you know, dropping out. Uh, and the people who adhere to those religions, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, all, can all destroy each other, as they're obviously doing. Let's take a little break right here, John, and we'll continue talking more and get into the idea of um, the, the artificial intelligence, so to speak, uh, get into the, 
the different Gnostics' ideas when it comes to um, alien intrusion and so forth. This is going to be very interesting. But uh, last few minutes here, for those who are interested in getting you your new book, Not in His Image, uh, how would we go about doing that? Well, just order it from Amazon. Uh, co.uk or whatever you know Amazon you have Amazon in Sweden excellent okay and do check yeah. out again of course uh, metahistory.org a vast resource huge resource with many much uh, articles uh, for you up there to read so do check it out we'll take a break right here then but we'll uh, we'll see you at the other side of the break John thank you good we are continuing our fascinating discussion with John Lash, author of Not in His Image, uh, and I, we want to change gear, I guess, a little bit, and then talk uh, a little bit more about the idea of um, what, what John calls Gnostic theory of alien intrusion, and uh, connect this with the Archons, of course. Uh, the Archons is a subject that I've been fascinated by for a long time, and John, maybe we could actually start with with the definition of that word itself. The, there seems to be a lot of different interpretations of it out there uh, seems to be some kind of you know almost dispute or confusion where the term actually comes from and what it means what's your uh, take take on the term uh, the archons well uh, there are two ways to define the term and you're absolutely right uh, Henrik even before we, we talk about it it's very very important to, to present as clear a definition of this term uh, in the Gnost as Gnostics understood it as possible because it it's a profoundly important term in the Gnostic teachings, and it leads us into some some really profound areas. Uh, in the first place, the word archon is a Greek word that was very common back in uh, in the days of, of Jesus Christ, back in in, in uh, two thousand years ago, and it simply meant governor, the or, or like the governor of a province was the archon. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what it meant in Greek, in a, in a mundane sense. But there are two ways to understand the word archon uh, if you want to uh, approach it as the Gnostics did. In the first place, the archons, an archon is a being that appears in the Gnostic creation myth. The Gnostics took this word archon out of its mundane context and they used it to describe a certain kind of cosmic entity. You see, the Gnostics had a creation myth. And this is the story of the divine Sophia, a goddess who turned into the earth. Now, on Metahistory Org, you'll find a lot about this story, and I've told this story in nine, in nine episodes. I also tell it in my book in nine episodes. In a sense, I reconstructed this myth. Mm. In this myth, uh, which is too long to go into here, there is an episode where the archons appear in the cosmic order. And they are called archons, because the word comes from the Greek uh, root arche, which means first or in the beginning. Hmm. And so what the Gnostics meant was that when our solar system was forming, before the earth itself actually took the form it has today, certain beings appeared in our solar system before the earth was formed. That's why they're called archons. They came first. And these beings are kind of described as a, an arch inorganic species, and they inhabit the solar system, but they do not inhabit the earth. So that's how the archons are described in the Gnostic mythology. Uh, if you go to the myth and, and read the myth and study the myth, which is absolutely fascinating, and it's a unique myth. The second part of the definition, which I think might be helpful, is this. The archons... Uh, who are also, trans scholars translate the word as rulers or authorities. Mm, yeah. uh, the archons are, play a great role in the Nag Hammadi materials. I would say that of the surviving Nag Hammadi materials, the Coptic materials, uh, maybe 20% or better of the texts deal with these entities. Hmm. And they not only describe them in the cosmic sense, how they emerged at the creation of our solar system before the Earth was formed, as I just described, but they also describe them in another very disturbing way. There are passages in certain Gnostic texts which resemble 100% close encounters with extraterrestrial beings. Hmm. And I've quoted these on the Metahistory site, 
And there's a great deal of material about this on the Metahistory site. And so the second part of the definition, this is very important, this is drawn directly from the Coptic text. Archons are extraterrestrial entities, and they are like psychic intruders. They intrude upon humanity, they intrude upon the human race. But because they cannot, they can't invade the earth as such, because they cannot live in the biosphere of the earth. Hmm. They live in the solar system, they are inorganic beings. But because they cannot invade the earth, they tend to invade our minds. They are entities that can reach us, you might say, interdimensionally, mm -hmm. or through a psychic and telepathic level. And all this is described quite vividly in the Gnostic uh, materials. And so it's quite remarkable, if you make the parallel with uh, gray ETs and close encounters, uh, if you, if you want to make that parallel, uh, I think there's a great deal of uh, evidence that that is a good parallel, and it's, it's a convincing parallel, and, and, and I've, uh, I've written about that a great deal, as you know. That's absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm so intrigued by that idea. Uh, let's go into that a little bit later. I want to ask you first, though, um, are there kind of any definition in, in the text of, of what the archons kind of are doing, what, the, what their purpose or, or what their goals are? Why are there... Or are they just around the planet Earth or everywhere in the universe? Is there any kind of definition of that? Yes, there is, there is amazingly precise definitions of this, really. And I think that uh, if I would speak of my own work as a scholar and my attempt to make Gnostic writings you know, accessible to people and to, and to, to make them uh, understandable, this is one of the most important points that I have uh, worked on. You know, no other scholar, uh, you know, I'm a self-taught scholar. I don't work with a university or anything. I'm responsible to no one but myself. Sure. And I'm responsible to my sense of the truth. Okay? Yep. Well, no other scholar dares to say anything about this archon material. <laughs> you can take a book, the most famous book about Gnosticism is the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels. Mm -hmm. It was published, I think, 24 years ago. It's still in print, widely read. The word Archon is not in the index. Really? Yeah. Even though it's obvious from reading the text that the Archons were a deep concern for the Gnostics, scholars will not have anything to do with this because it is it freaks them out. <laughs> and it also looks very much like parapsychology, and, uh, you know, UFO ET material. Sure. And, of course, as scholars, they wouldn't dare touch that because it would completely ruin their reputation. That's, that's unfortunately right. That's unfortunately the case. So now I'm going to answer your question. It is remarkable that we find in the Nag Hammadi text an explicit description not only of the origin of these extraterrestrial archons, but of their purposes, of the way they operate, of their methods, and of their tactics in regard to the human species. <laughs> it's remarkable. And, and there are a couple of points that I would just make, and then we'll explore it more based on your questions. One mm -hmm. of the things, the Gnostic materials warn us about these entities. There's a clear warning that these entities endanger the human species because they can lead us astray from our proper course of evolution. Mm. They're deviant they can deviate us, and they do this in two ways. One is through the factor of what is called error, or plane in Greek. Plane, by the way, is the root of the word planet. Hmm. Uh, so, error is one of the ways that the, that the archons mislead us, and that is when we, we are beings who, who need to think and plan things in advance. That is the nature of our species. We stand out from other animals because we have planning abilities, we can make models, and then we can follow those models, and we can actually create things from those models, right. which other species cannot do. To the, and the Gnostics warned that when we make mistakes in that process, if we do not correct those mistakes, the archons will enter our minds and they will use those mistakes to steer us away from the earth and to steer us away
away from our true path. <laughs> so they warned about error. They called them messengers of error. <laughs> the second thing they warned about, very explicitly, is they said that the primary capacity of the archons is something called HAL. H-A-L. Really? H-A-L is a Coptic word. And what it means is simulation. <laughs> simulation or artifice. Hmm. Or you could say virtual reality. Uh, an example of HAL is plastic and pearl. Suppose I put a white round object in your hand and I say to you that's a pearl. Well, you, we know that a pearl is made by nature. Mm -hmm. It's made under the sea in the body of an oyster. Human beings cannot do that. It's done by nature. Sure. But suppose I say this is a pearl in your hand when actually it's just a ball of plastic that looks like a pearl. Mm -hmm. Now suppose that you were incapable of telling the pearl from the plastic. Mm -hmm. That would be how. That would be simulation. And one of the things that the Gnostics warned about is that there's a tendency in our own mind to become infatuated with our models, our fictions, and our simulations. And the more that we do that, in a sense, the more we allow these archons to take over our minds. Hmm. It's a very sophisticated for, uh, uh, analysis, and it's a very, very uh, strong warning. Hmm. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So... so um in regards to the text, again, going back, do you think that, uh, or, or rather, do you know if, if uh, I mean, how, how could could the Gnostics back then known of their existence? Is, is there any hint of that, meaning that was this something they uh, discovered while, while uh, you know, they were in, in uh, prayer or some kind of meditation, or was this something they would have just been aware of because of their uh, ancestors have been passing down information? Any clues on that? How could the Gnostics know of the existence of these entities? How could they know how they came into existence in the first place? Yeah. How could the Gnostics know about how our solar system was created? How could they know what the techniques and the, and the tactics of the Archons are? I pondered those questions very seriously. Now, you will not find in the text themselves an, a direct ex answer to those questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mislead you on that. So, but I have an answer, and I feel confident about it. But I, I must tell you that my answer is, is from an inference. Mm. Okay? Mm. I'm just making an inference. Sure. This is John Lash's inference, and you can take it or leave it. This is what he thinks. He thinks that the Gnostic schools of the mysteries, which existed up until the Christian time, were actually the uh, inheritors of many thousands of years of spiritual and shamanic practice. The Gnostics were shamans, and they inherited from the, their ancestors in Europe, in Scandinavia, from the great traditions of the great seers like Odin. Mm. Odin would be a typical example of an ancient Gnostic, an ancient shaman. Mm. And so Gnosticism is the flower of indigenous European shamanism. And if this is true, then I would infer that Gnostics were parapsychologists, that they could experience alternative realities, that they could explore the astral world, they could explore other worlds, and in the process of their shamanism and their practice of uh, heightened awareness, they detected these entities directly. They encountered these entities. They looked into the history of the solar system, call it what you will, reading the Akashic Record, Call it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. We know today that shamans in indigenous cultures in the Amazon and elsewhere have these faculties. Hmm. And right. shamans from, say, the ayahuasca shamans of, of, uh, of Peru mm -hmm. and the Amazon, and shamans in other cultures around the world, in Africa, for instance, uh, report the same information about these entities. So when you ask me how they know, I say to you, they were accomplished shamans who had uh, faculties of higher perception that allowed them to experience these things directly. Hmm. That is my view. Yeah, very interesting. Do you think that they, it could be possible that at the same time they had, I mean, there are so many uh, uh, stories of, of when, uh, for example, the 
many of the South American tribes are, are entering into this other world, so to speak, that they have contact with other forms of entities that actually hands down information to them, something about what is happening on Earth or their own health in some cases. There are so many stories about this. Do oh, you think, indeed. Do you think that and could in fact, be... there is hmm? textual evidence for that. Sure. There are uh, about, I think, three or four of the Nag Hammadi texts uh, that present themselves as what we would today call uh, documents of channeling. Mm-hmm. You know? Sure. Channeling. And in those texts, uh, we have a report, as it were, a kind of shorthand report. It's not for, the, the reports are kind of, uh, you know, uh, like notes taken in a classroom, hmm. you know. Hmm. And the report seems to indicate that there is a there is a master or a, or, or a seer or shaman who is standing in front of the group of of, uh, of students and is communicating with a, a higher dimensional being. Mm. and channeling information from that being. Mm. And there are texts which actually show that, one of which is called uh, the Discourse on the Eighth and the Ninth. The Discourse on the Eighth and the Ninth is a Nag Hammadi text that actually describes that kind of channeling session. Mm. And so you're absolutely right. Some of the information that Gnostics received came from contacting higher intelligences, and it's clear from the text that they discerned and detected many different kinds of non-human entities in the cosmos. Hmm. And not all of them were uh, hostile to humanity. In fact, many of them were were allies. Right. Huh. But they did detect one predatory species, the Archons. Huh. And, and one yeah. is all it takes, man. Sure, One right. is all it takes. Yeah. It's like the malaria. It's like malaria. It only takes one mosquito, an Anopheles mosquito, to bite you, mm. to give you malaria. Sure. There are many mosquitoes in the world, many kinds of instincts, but it only takes one. And so they were seemed to have been terribly concerned that there was one predatory species, the archons, that we really need to watch out for. Hmm. And it even might be very difficult going going into this other place and discern who's who, so to speak, who's hostile, who's not, who's deceiving, who's giving me right information here. That must always be a concern, right? Well, you know, it's very interesting. There was a book that came out in 1980 called The Way of the Shaman by Michael Harner. And this was a key book in bringing shamanism into the mainstream. And Michael Harner was a psychiatrist from uh, Connecticut or somewhere in the East Coast who went to uh, South America and, you know, did ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And under the ayahuasca trance, he had a vision and so forth, and he saw various things. And, uh, of course, the session of ayahuasca he did was, was, uh, was, uh, uh, controlled or managed by some of uh, the, the veteran ayahuasca shamans who were in that region. Right. And Michael Hunter relates this amazing incident of how he came out of his ayahuasca vision and he, he turned to the old, uh, Brazilian shaman there to tell him what he'd experienced, you know. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, I met these dragon-like beings and they had wings and they said that they came uh, to the earth in a, in a boat and they brought the seeds of humanity here in this boat, in this big canoe and so forth and mm-hmm. so on. And isn't that fascinating? Now I know how humanity originated. <laughs> and the old Brazilian shaman looked at him and laughed. Yeah. And he said, well, they always tell everybody that. They're just a bunch of liars, you know. <laughs> Uh. And so the interesting thing is that if you're going to practice shamanism and you're going to go into altered states of consciousness, you must learn how to distinguish the trick, how to see what the tricksters are doing, because there are many tricksters out there. Yeah, I can imagine. (laughs) And you must, it's part of the practice of knowing the true from the false. Yeah. Just like in any other field of, of, uh, in any other field of life, you know? Of course. So I believe that the, that the Gnostics were highly accomplished shamans who could, who could detect the difference and, and, uh, that they pinpointed these archons as particularly, a particular menace to us. Hmm. Absolutely fascinating. Now let let's dive into a little bit about. Uh, well, I guess I want to start at 1947 and move on from there. Um, mm-hmm. I want to talk about Roswell or Rosewell. I want to mm-hmm. talk Roswell. about Roswell, exactly the discovery. Roswell, New Mexico, right? Yeah, and and the discovery of of the Nag Hammadi Library in in right. a similar time period. 
Uh, we could talk about the the OSS becoming the CIA. You know how that That's right. transpired. There's so much there. Where, where do you want to begin? <laughs> well, I think you know uh, there's a there's a piece on that on, on the site, of course, 1947 Nexus. I think that that uh, it's fascinating. We could talk about that for the rest of, of the night. Just point out the essential facts. I'll, I'll just point this out for those of your listeners who don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nakamadi texts were discovered, actually, by an Arab peasant in December 1945, but their importance was not recognized. They were just stuffed in a drawer in a museum in Cairo. And it was not until June 1947 when another scholar came from France, uh, Jean de Ress came from France, and that he was shown these and he realized how important they were. Now, June, July, August of 1947 was a time when simultaneously a number of other events occurred. That was also the year that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And so, uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are, an, are, are, are another kind of document. They were discovered near Jerusalem and they were written in, in Hebrew and Aramaic. Mm -hmm. But they form an important part of this story. The Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered. The CIA uh, was founded from the OSS. And a, and a whole number of other things occurred in 1947. It was sort of like an explosion of the human psyche. Hmm. And um, the, we're kind of living in the, re, in the effects of that explosion now. And the main effect of that is that these uh, esoteric religious uh, documents, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi documents, are somehow all mixed up with our ideas of global conspiracy and our ideas of extraterrestrial, mm. um, you know, extraterrestrial influence. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it's just remarkable. Yeah. Uh, just a little over uh, 60 years ago uh, that it all seemed to explode at the same moment. It did. Uh, you always kind of, uh, you already, I should say, have kind of laid out the idea that the Oracons possibly could could either be the the, the grace or have a, some kind of a relationship to them, uh, and I want to explore that further, and I want to explore the idea of alien technology further, and what is happening with us now. I guess the, the first thing I would like to ask is, do you think that possibly then there was a, a downed uh, craft, so to speak, a, a craft that crashed in Roswell around 47, right. and a consequence right. of that was that we attained some kind of alien technology? Right. Right. The Roswell uh, crash, which took place also in that, in that year, uh, is significant because the Roswell crash is the basis of what is called the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Mm. Uh, if you look on Metahistory Org, you'll find in the, in the site guide, there's a, uh, 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 an article called Nine Theories of Extraterrestrial Influence. Mm. There are nine, and I outline nine different theories. One of those theories is the Gnostic theory, which I've been discussing with you. Mm -hmm. But the most well-known one, of course, is the so-called extraterrestrial hypothesis. And according to this hypothesis, uh, an alien spacecraft crashed in Roswell in 1947, and bodies were recovered, living bodies. And what happened is that the American government secretly cut a deal with these gray aliens and got from them technology, secrets of technology, in return for allowing them to experiment on the human race to abduct people, to interbreed, and so forth and so on. Mm. Okay? Mm. That's the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which is the most widely accepted conspiracy theory. Now, you're asking me, do I think that uh, that crash actually took place? Well, mm. uh, you know, I want to say this, that in the Gnostic materials that I've studied, there are descriptions of close encounters, mm -hmm. of abductions, mm -hmm. vivid descriptions. And there are also descriptions of the gray-type aliens and a reptilian-type alien. Really? Those are in the text. Huh. But I must add that there are no descriptions of hardware. There are no descriptions of flying saucers in the Gnostic material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I tend to be very, very cautious when I hear claims that there's actually hardware that it has, you know, uh, crashed and so forth. There are descriptions of hardware and flying saucers in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. So these these sightings have occurred from very ancient times. So my answer would be, I really don't know. I tend to think that 
the Roswell story may have been largely invented and that it may be being used to manipulate people. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complex subject, but, sure, uh, sure. you know, I kind of follow Jacques Vallée on this, oh. Jacques Vallée who wrote Messengers of Deception. Mm. <clears throat> he was, in my opinion, the most intelligent and careful analyst of the UFO phenomena. Mm. Uh, and he says whether or not uh, alien spacecraft has a- have actually crashed, the story about them controls people's minds and manipulates people. Hmm. And I sort of take that view. Hmm. Well, the, sorry uh, if it sounds like I'm I'm weaseling out of the question. No, 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 no. That's 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 a perfect one because I also want to kind of go into that area a little bit. That if. Because earlier you said that that these archons are kind of a you know not physical so to speak. This is something otherworldly that that can't occupy bodies. But what I kind of want to lead into here a little bit is the fact that they actually are interested in inhabiting bodies on this planet, meaning that they want to in some way either incarnate into body bodies or actually build something either from genetic material or from uh, me- mechanic, you know, robotics basically that they can uh, I- incarnate into. W- one idea that has been laid forth is, is the idea that the greys actually are uh, robots, if we think of the idea of how we do things That's now. That's right. Meaning that we send probes, we send robots into space to explore other planets. That's right. So why could not the greys be a more uh, you know, artificial intelligence, almost kind of a entity in itself, coming here exploring on behalf of some other intelligence from another That's solar right. system? You know. Okay. Now, there are, of course, thousands and thousands of theories about this, and there's a lot of confusion about it. Let me see if I can give you, as briefly as possible, a Gnostic approach that may be helpful. Sure. What I draw from what the Gnostics said about the Archons are two important points. The first point is that they are an inorganic species, you know, probably silicon, mercury kind of base, Hmm. and that they live in the solar system at large, but they cannot live in the biosphere of the Earth. So for them to come into the biosphere of the Earth is more or less like a human being diving into the bottom of the ocean. We need to have very complicated diving gear. We need to uh, either go in a diving uh, bell or we have to have some kind of uh, bulky diving equipment. Mm -hmm. But we cannot stay down at the bottom of the ocean very long because we're not uh, designed to live there. So this explains why the actual physical appearances of these aliens would be so erratic and so brief. Because they're only able to, to, to make brief forays into our atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's one explanation. The second point is, is even more important. You raise the question, well, do they, want to, do they want to incarnate? Do they want to somehow become embodied on Earth and take over the Earth? Well, from what I draw from the Gnostic writings, this is not their aim. Their aim is more or less to invade our minds and to live through us. Now, if they succeed in doing that, then we would become archontic. Mm -hmm. I use that adjective, Mm -hmm. archontic. Sure. What does it mean to become archontic? If the human race were to become archontic, we would show a change of behavior that would be dramatic. First of all, we would only live in simulated or artificial environments. We would sever all connections with the natural world. Second, if the human race were to become archontic, we would make ourselves into robots. Hmm. We would become robotized in our behavior. We would become like robots like robot zombies, and we would attempt to do everything to replace our natural organs with prosthetic organs. Hmm. We would, for instance, if we had a perfectly natural legs, we would prefer to uh, per, uh, replace those legs with robotic legs. Bionic, yeah. Be- be- bionic. We would become bionic. We would go into a bionic phase. That is if, now, that is how we would behave if What the Gnostics warned is true. The Archons primarily are mind parasites. 
They don't have the capacity really to incarnate as human beings, but they have the capacity to go so deeply into our minds that we can ter- try to become them. They make us try to become like they are. <laughs> That's how I understand what they would do. And I see many indications of us going in that direction oh, in yeah. the current technology, in nanotechnology, bionics, and those things that you are looking at, uh, you know, on your site. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and, and I mean, there are so many points there that I want to pick up on, but one thing at a time here. They're, they're, the reason for them, for, you know, changing us, so to speak, for going right. first into our minds and then changing our bodies, which consequently also reflects our minds, so we would change our own mentality. Exactly. Um, would that, w- the interest from the Archons, do you think that that is for, what is their own purposes for you, or, or the, do they want to use us for something? Uh, you know, is there a galactic war going on? What, what's no, happening? <laughs> no, I have to tell you, this is, what I'm going to tell you now is extremely weird, but I am not making it up. What I'm going to tell you now is my best expression of what I have found in the Gnostic writings. Mm. The first point is absolutely clear. The Gnostics say that the motivation of the Archons is envy. Mm. They use that word envy, phonos in Greek. They say that the Archons envy us because we're kind of like a cousin species to them. But we are the privileged cousins because we live in a paradise, which is the earth and the biosphere. And they live out in the solar system at large, and they, they have hardware, I'm sure they do, and they move around among the various planets, and they have space stations among the various planets, and as you know, there's been quite a bit of confirmation of this since NASA has been out there poking around. Mm. Okay? Mm. But they envy us because we live in an actual paradise. We live in a, in a place that is sensual, in a place that is beautiful, in a place that is sheltered from the rest of the universe. And so... The first thing that they teach us about them is that they envy us. Envy us. Mm-hmm. The second thing they say is really mind-boggling. They say that the Gnostics, that the, that the Archons operate in a senseless manner, that they have no real plan, that they are just senselessly disrupting us. And they get a certain satisfaction out of doing that. They get a satisfaction out of, they get kind of a vicarious thrill when we are fearful and confused, the intensity of the emotion of fear and the intensity of, of confusion seems in a way to feed them. Hmm. And so in the final analysis, and I know this is not an easy thing to accept, but I'm giving you my best, you know, my best uh, uh, research here. Sure, in sure. the final analysis, they're tricksters. They're tricksters. They're not really predators who want to come in and take over the earth and turn it into the matrix. Mm-hmm. And then, then they, they, you know, if they did that, they wouldn't even have any satisfaction. They'd probably just go on and do something else somewhere else. Mm-hmm. They, they are tricksters, and their fascination is with our minds. It's a mind game. It's a battle in the mind. Mm. It's a cosmic test. You know, I, I have an article on the site in which I draw more than 12 exact parallels between the archons and the so-called flyers that are described in the work of Carlos Castaneda. Mm-hmm. You know, the last book of Castaneda, called The Active Side of Infinity, was published just after he died. Okay. And many people may not have read that last book of Castaneda, but I tell you, it's absolutely remarkable because it deals completely with this subject, with predators and psychic invasion. That's mm. the subject of that book. Mm-hmm. And he calls these predator entities the flyers, and he describes them in many ways that are exactly parallel to what the Gnostics say. And at one point, Castaneda is having a conversation with Don Juan, and I would add, by the way, it doesn't matter if you believe if this is made up or not, sure, sure. because the truth comes in fictional form and in factual form. I believe so, yeah. So Castaneda is having this conversation with Don Juan, who says to him, and he's a very old shaman who can detect these beings, and Don Juan says, they're the way that the universe tests us to see if we can master our own minds. And I believe that that's the final statement about the Archons. It's a test. They are tricksters. They're malicious tricksters. 
but they don't really have any grand plan or any grand scheme behind it. They just like to fuck with our minds. <laughs> so, I mean, w within the framework of the universe, one, one you know, questions, mm -hmm, but what is their purpose done? But, but, they don't uh, have a purpose. Uh, but, I but, I, but I think that they do. <laughs> I mean... If they if they kind of repre represents uh, sorry represents a kind of a breakdown aspect to to you know what the universe creates and so forth, this is a way for um, for the universe to make something stronger or, or or better or more efficient or what what have you. If we look at nature, these things happen all the time. There is a a cycle of of death, so to speak, uh, winter, and then we have the summer or spring. You know when things grow but right. it's it's a necessary process in order for the, the the you know continuation of the universe so in effect they do feel a purpose to kind of uh, you know if we compare it to uh, how bacteria and antibodies work or or whatnot w would you th say that that might be you know the reason for them so to speak i i agree with you and i follow you on that when i say they don't have a purpose what i mean is that they in themselves don't have a designated aim for their activity. Right, right. Yet, you are, you are absolutely correct. The nature of the activity and the way that it affects our species has a purpose in the great scheme of things. Hmm. I believe that they are hmm. tricksters from beyond the earth who invade our minds and who test us and that we must face the archons. And I've faced them many times and many people have met them. But unfortunately, in the... UFO ET literature, there's not enough uh, information about how to resist these beings, you know? Mm -hmm. And they can be resisted. And in fact, the, the Gnostic teachings uh, contain explicit information about how to resist them and repel them. Hmm, really, no? Yes, uh, Kundalini and the Alien Force hmm, is perhaps the most important essay on this subject in Metahistory Org. Oh. Kundalini and the Alien Force describes cites Gnostic documents and describes techniques used to repel these mind parasites. So there is a game going on here. There is a test involved, uh, and it's a cosmic test. And you are absolutely right. It falls into the general plan of evolution that, uh, that we would be tested in this way. And those who kind of succumb, I guess, to their, to their trickery, uh, right. Is that a way? Um, and this is going to sound horrible, but but who knows what the construct of the universe is? Things die all the time. What I'm getting at is, uh, is this a way for the universe to actually, you know, clean off some of the, oh, how should I put it? So, you know, uh, a consciousness that that hasn't taken control of, of itself, so to speak, meaning that that they can't fight out these forces, and this is a way for 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 the creation to. Uh, to advance, you know, through generations, so the consciousness actually becomes more efficient, stronger, better, more, you know, independent, whatnot. Do you think that could be the case? In my view, my friend, that is exactly the case. Mm. And I couldn't say it better myself. Uh, you know, I was having some uh, one time, which uh, I was having a... Uh, doing some explorations in heightened awareness, <laughs> put it in that way, <laughs> and I was sure. practicing some shamanism, you could say. Mm -hmm. And when I practice shamanism, I do it with specific intention. I just don't do it recreationally, you know, I sit around and look at hallucinations. Understand. But I ask questions, and I pursue things. And in one particular session, I asked a question about the archons. I asked what was their purpose in, this, in the scheme of the earth. And the answer I got was exactly what you just said, they're here to clean out the part of our species that cannot take responsibility for its own mind. Hmm. Because, see, mind is our gift. The Gnostics called it nous, N-O-U-S, and they taught that our intelligence is a spark of divinity, that we have a spark of divine intelligence in us, nous, hmm. and that what makes our species unique and what makes it novel and allows us to be to play and invent and create and innovate is that we have this divine intelligence. And, but, but it's being tested, and in those members of our species that, it cannot, that it's not mastered will be sheared away. Hmm. And the archons are, in a, in a sense, the tool for shearing away a part of the human species. Hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's, uh, as I said, that that's... That is kind of, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, things... It's, it's in very scary. Yeah. But I think <laughs> it's true. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, who again? Who I mean, we we there 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 is a reason why there are you know so many philosophies around the humanity as as such is still you know pondering what the purpose of everything is obviously and that's right and we can't you know you know in front of that we can't say no the the universe isn't that brutal in a way it actually goes back to the idea that we talked about earlier that if it is the case that a creator god needs a sacrifice how again mm-hmm. can we question that that you know can we question that idea meaning that we might not be in a position right now to understand why that is a necessary uh, you know act or whatever for the universe to sustain itself mhm um any ideas well in this case i would i think it's an elegant solution you know by the way it's sophia's solution sophia is my name taken from the gnostic myth for gaia mm. for the intelligence of the earth she is the hostess with the mostess, as we say in the States. She is the planet on which we live, and uh, she is also the re- responsible for the creation of the Ar- Archon. She produced the Archons. And if mm-hmm. you want to learn about how that happens, you have to read the Gnostic creation myth. Mm-hmm. But as I understand Sophia, uh, Sophia uh, has uh, great faith in human intelligence. She believes in the particular gift of our species, and celebrates it, and yet she also uh, gives our species the option to eliminate itself. Hmm. Yeah, well, we can that, eliminate ourselves. That's freedom. And we're doing a mm. fantastic job of it, if you ask me. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Not yeah. only because of the pollution that we've created out of our ignorance, because we haven't corrected our mistakes, remember, we haven't corrected our errors. Mm. It was an error to create the internal combustion machine, Without first solving the problem of the pollution that it would uh, it would cause, that well, was an error. Well, I, I actually don't agree with you there. I, I see I, I see that that is a perfect way for us during that particular time in history when the, when that technology became available, when the discovery of oil in that sense was was made. Mm-hmm. But, but what I do see as as a faulty thing though is that our lack of moving on from there right now. Right. I mean, there are so many technologies available now, and. And on one, I mean, I'm 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 kind of jumping between the both of these sides, so to speak. I don't know if you have a more cautious, uh, overall cautious um, uh, mindset towards technology and the development of it. I see it more that it is, you know, beneficial to our development, and the reason for that we are involved in it is because we actually are creators in a sense ourselves, and we want to create and, you know, improve our, our environment or whatnot. But again, obviously, this can always be used at a, at a you know, a negative uh, usage, and we can, you know, as a consequence of that, and you're right there, that we are... Well, I don't have any our... objection to that view at all. In fact, I, I like uh, what you said sure. uh, very much. In the time and setting that it was invented, the combustion engine was uh, internal combustion engine was a, was an appropriate invention for us. And the yeah. problem is that we didn't move on and improve it. Exactly. Yeah. We stayed with the model that we invented in the first place, even when we knew that it had very bad side effects. Well, and then but, we have people, you know, adding lead to the gasoline that wasn't necessary from for, to begin with. You know, right. the diesel engine from from right. you know the the German guy, I think diesel that was you know ev- even more environmentally friendly than the stuff we use today, basically. You know, right. That's right. So I I, I agree with you on that. I I think that. I do have a very cautious uh, view, obviously, of technology. I'm not exactly a technophobic person, sure. but I have a very cautious view, and my strongest objection to technology is that I am concerned about the technology that would lead us in this archontic direction. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of the hype about the new technology in bionics and artificial intelligence, I think, is quite dangerous it and is and probably delusional, uh, you know, Marshall McLuhan, who was this guy who was kind of a pop guru back in the 60s, mm-hmm. warned way back then about the danger of, of a prosthetic device, you know? Mm-hmm. Prosthetic device is like if your teeth fall out, you get, you get false teeth, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. And he, 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 or if your arm is cut off, you get an artificial arm put, off, put on, but he warned that we would, we would, uh, adopt prosthetic devices that we don't even need, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like, why, if I have a perfectly good set of teeth, why would I want to put 
false teeth on my teeth, you know. You but I think that's what a, a quite a bit of this uh, new technology is proposing, sure. especially this technology that's leading in the direction of, you know, the immortal uh, immortality fantasies, which which you get into uh, quite a bit on your site, I notice, and I'm I'm interested in how you view that and how you're going to handle that subject because uh, I've also written quite a lot about that. Mm, yeah, I, I do want to tip, uh, you know, uh, give a tip later on uh, in regards to a short film that we did that really goes in a little bit and and ask a little bit of questions about this idea of of longevity in connection to the archons. And one thing that we did in this short film was to and I don't know if you read this article or not, but uh, those who are involved right now in, in um, the Human Genome Project, one mainly, uh, Craig Venter is, is one of the guys Venter, right. very prominent right now. Yeah. Uh, and he was, of course, involved in this uh, project set out to uh, first map the human genome, but now right. they, they set up a new context uh, contest that actually is about uh, mapping the DNA of what they call it high speed sequencing of mapping the DNA of multiple persons basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this this uh, this is an X prize by the way. And they the interesting thing here is that they named the contest the Archons uh, a Genomics X Prize contest. Did they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, wow, what the heck is going on there, right? Eh? Any you idea? know, this immortality idea is a central theme of the uh, Abrahamic religions. Did you know that? What, it come again, say that again. The immortality idea, uh -huh. the idea that you could have an immortal physical body, mm -hmm. deathless, is part of the Abrahamic religions. Well, again, that's why a guy like Aubrey de Grey, we, we touched upon this in our short film too, he names his foundation that, that is into longevity research, the Methuselah foundation that is derived directly from the Bible, from the oldest person in the Bible, actually. Right, but it's not quite the right name. That's not the figure, that's not the actual figure in the Bible who represents immortality. Really, okay. Methuselah represents longevity. Right, right. Not immortality. Sure, okay. Mm -hmm. Morta immortality is represented by another being called Melchizedek. Uh-huh, Okay. And Melchizedek is the whole foundation. Melchizedek is the being who founded the whole Abrahamic religion and Christianity and Judaism. Okay. Ah, huh. according... And Melchizedek is mm -hmm. described in the Bible as being without age, without parents, and without, gener without generation. Hmm. Meaning that he was not born in a natural way, generation being biological reproduction, right? Mm -hmm. Now... This description of Melchizedek, which occurs in Romans in the New Testament, is absolutely startling because it's a description of a cloned human being hmm. who can live forever. <laughs> really? Yes. Thank God. And that figure, that idea, and that figure are present at the core of these religions. And all of the people who adhere to these religions believe, you know, that in one form or another, well, after death, they will, they will be, if they do what the Father God wants and they're mm -hmm. obedient, mm -hmm. uh, after death, they will be resurrected and given an immortal body. Hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> so, so that, and even the idea of, uh, you know, at the end of days, everyone will uh, rise again from the grave, basically. You That's know? right. Huh. That's right. And so this concept that Ventner and these other people are working toward are the uh, transhumanists. You've heard sure. of them, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. These people who are proposing that through artificial intelligence and genomics we can create an immortal human being are actually working out an ancient religious belief system. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah? If, again, if, if we look at the terminology used, and, in, and even the symbolism in some cases, uh, the usage of the grail, for instance, have been kind of, you know, again, connected with the longevity theme. That's uh, right. There, there's so many things there. So uh, the, the question obviously becomes... Uh, at, at this point, um, the people that are involved in this are they then influenced by the archons on, on a you know unconscious level that they are being affected, or are they consciously you know driving this because of their own you know ego or, or interest or, or that they themselves actually are involved in some very you know occult basically uh, uh, mythology you know? Well, if I wanted to be you know very cautious about it, Enric, I would say well. They're probably just, you know, scientists with big egos who, are, you know, who want to make a big score, okay? Mm, sure. But if we want to look a little, scratch the surface and look a little deeper, 
I have to tell you that I wouldn't be at all surprised if these characters are involved in some level of occultism, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if the Archon influence is not what's really driving them, if they are not have become archontically deviated. It's mm -hmm. a deviation mm -hmm. uh, away from humanity toward a kind of mutation of the human species. <laughs> now, it's either going to be one thing or the other. Either we're going to reach that mutation, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, science will reach those goals, or we won't. And if we don't reach them, uh, we may uh, end up wiping ourselves out in the, in the meantime, you know? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much how it looks to me. <laughs> hmm. Well, that's pretty scary. I mean, uh, one thing is, of course, what is what is the option here? I, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of look at all of this as a way to... I say that we need to take the good parts of every little piece, you know, that we have, and 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 mm -hmm. and make sure to move on. That's that's the most important thing that we that we actually don't stop in our tracks in that sense. That we continue to evolve and 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 you know, again, consciously evolve, not just you know, go flying off on some other you know weird path of some uh, you know interests of of one single person or whatnot, but. Uh, I mean, many people see that the option at this point is to, no, we need to, you know, totally dismantle everything we, we got and, and, and go back, you know, go back to the ancient times, go back to, uh, you know, the, a, a pagan religion and so forth. And, and, and right. that's the best thing. What do you see as an option at this point that we can do, you know? Well, first of all, I want to say that what you're expressing here is what I call the heroic attitude, you know. Uh, Joseph Campbell, who was a great mythologist and some people consider me to be his, his successor, mm -hmm. uh, wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Mm -hmm. And I also wrote a book called The Hero. And what you're expressing is the heroic attitude, the warrior attitude, that is that we face a perhaps incomprehensible uh, situation and we face impossible odds, but we try to turn that into something good. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So you're asking me, well, what good option can we make out of this? Well, that's a fucking great question, you know? <laughs> Uh, I don't believe, by the way, I'm obviously a pagan and a mystic, but I don't believe that we would go back to ancient paganism. I believe that we might go to some kind of future paganism. Hmm. But specifically on this subject of genomes and creating the immortal human being, it's hard to say, you know. I guess I would say that the option for me would be this. Rather than thinking about how I could mutate into an immortal human being, I would like to know what is the absolute most I can get out of my mortal physical body. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. What is the most bliss I can experience? What is the most pleasure? What is the, the highest intensity of feeling and perception that I can have in this mortal body? I guess that would be my option. I guess I would say, well, I would like to see What's the most I can get out of that? And then maybe if I'm not satisfied with that, we could consider mutating into some other form. Mm. You know? mm. So mm. I guess that would be my response. I'm really into the body. <laughs> <laughs> sure, absolutely. Well, yeah. you know, what about the idea that, um, you know, I, I've been pondering on that idea of where we're heading right now. And, I, and again, I can see that there's very, you know, very you know, good purpose, so to speak, with all the connectivity that is going on. I said the internet is a kind of uh, basically a rep rep representation of the the neural pathways of you know Gaia, basically that right. uh, all these little cells running around human beings then are are you know connected to each other, and that's wonderful uh, and all of that. But then on the other side, you have the danger of that you know the microchipped population with the computer you know interface you know everyone hooking up to the to the same illusion and the, and then we're basically going to go just deeper into the matrix and 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 we actually are going to lose our individuality and our own consciousness in that process so well, that's you describe you describe it beautifully i mean you describe the the i think that's the really the great challenge that we face that is the challenge of globalization yeah and you describe both the positive side of it and the negative side of it, you know. Mm. And, boy, I, I don't pretend to have the answer to that. I don't have the answer to a lot of things, you know. But I'll tell you what my sense is. My sense is that, you know, there used to be in the States, we used to have this bumper sticker. Because, you know, people in the United States express the most profound philosophies <laughs> on the back of their cars. You know? Right. 
And the bumper sticker said, think globally, act locally. Mm. You know? Yeah. So my observation would be this, that no matter how much positive globalization we have, you know, no matter how much we become neurally connected across the planet, like mm. you and I are, are being connected by Internet radio. Sure. Uh, you have to live locally. You don't live on the earth. You live in a place on the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to live locally. And as long, you know, and this, in, there's a name for this. It's called bioregionalism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Bioregionalism is a term which means that the people who live in a place have a profound relationship to the place they live. Right. And so I think as long as we can maintain bioregionalism, and as long as people live locally, which means grow their own food locally, understand where their water comes from locally, understand the nature or immediately around where they live, then I think that's the grounding we need mm. to not be driven out of our minds by globalization. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, bl I believe you're, you're right on there. I, I, I'm kind of looking at that too as a kind of you know, some of the solution. The question, though, is that arise obviously is, Is is our is our local or are our local kind of uh, surroundings changing because of uh, you know climate change? Things are obviously going on. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt of that. And could we end up in a situation where we actually cannot longer you know s sustain things as they are on the planet? Do you think that's a, a, a possible danger here? I think that it's probable that it's gonna it's going in that direction. Uh, certainly, the the local impact of certain global changes is is obvious to me. I you know, I could give you many examples. Uh, mm. the way animals are behaving, the way the seasons come uh, six weeks earlier than normal. Or no season at all. Oh no <laughs> season at all. Yeah. You know? I think we are going to face that and I think that's going to be one of the challenges to our adaptation for adaptation, you see. Mm. But here again we get back to the archonic question. The archonic question. You know, it's like I'm saying, well If we're going to be facing now global warming and meltdown of the Greenland ice shelf and all kinds, if we're going to be able facing uh, changes in the biosphere, how are we as a species going to face these changes in the biosphere if we're totally absorbed in artificial reality? Mm -hmm. You know, if we have become so archontic that all we can do is relate to our machines and our iPods and our computers and our, all these devices and gimmicks that we have, hmm. how the hell are we ever going to face the crisis in our, in our natural environment, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I think we're really coming to... We're, very, we're in that crisis. We're not coming to it. We are in it. Mm. We're in it. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's the generation of, uh, of the people who are in their 20s and 30s now mm. who really have to be smart and uh, have a lot of courage to face this mm -hmm. yeah and and then we have the idea of of conflicting information constantly there are different reports coming out that the ice sheet for example aren't actually melting there are actually right. rebuilds up in other places we have that's right we, we have and ha have philosophers that that propose that Uh, added carbon carbon uh, dioxide to the to the atmosphere actually might be a very good thing because uh, plants and so forth, you know, harvest uh, harvest they they live on that basically, you know. We could right. have consequently more rain because of that. We might actually moving into a whole new era of the plant, being the era where the plant becomes more, you know, gives more, so to speak, more more growth and more, you know, the desert, you know, begin to disappear and so forth. But bec but a consequence of that meaning that. If we try to stop this now we're, with removing carbon monoxide, that's the consequence of that is that we're going to live, you know, in a in a worse environment. I, I don't know. That's right. <laughs> Any ideas? It's crazy making. We don't really know, but whichever of those scenarios is true, the fact remains that we're going to have to adapt to changes in the environment, and if we make ourselves too dependent on our technology we are going to be less able to make that adaptation. You see, that's mm -hmm. my point again. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, technology has that danger. We become dependent on our toys and our devices. Mm -hmm. And a species that's dependent on its toys and devices, when it has to get out there like the beavers and the birds and the whales mm -hmm. and deal with the changes in the environment, is going to be wiped out in, in 10 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's... So it's all about getting back to nature. Sounds very corny, but that's what it is about, and and that's what my message is about: sacred ecology. Sure. And, 
and I believe that the, the Gnostics were profound mystics and, and shamans who who looked deeply into uh, the processes of nature and understood nature in an intimate way, and I think that we would benefit from following their example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we are actually moving in. Uh, the consciousness is beginning to, you know, go go back to that idea. I mean, in ma- in many cases, not you know, ag- again, this is not across the board of 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 how overall humanity behaves or whatnot. But if we don't learn of it, I think we're going to have to be forced to learn the hard way. And I, I hate to go down that road, you know. That's right. And as as far as the learning process is concerned, how does our species learn to cooperate with nature to become symbiotic? and to make the best of the natural environment, that is, uh, to, to be in harmony with Gaia, if you want to put it that way, right. well, that's where entheogens come in. And that's why Metahistory Org, although it may not appear so at first sight, is one of the most powerful entheogenic sites on the Internet, as far as I know. Hmm. Uh, my intention, anyway, is to send a very strong message about entheogens or sacred plants, or what I want to call medicine plants, mm-hmm. You know, we now know that of all the millions, first of all, plants are the most prolific uh, species on the earth. Right. There are more plants than any other species, okay? Mm-hmm. And we know that of the millions, uh, of the hundreds of thousands of plant species, there are about 200 of those that have a very special nature. That is that when we ingest them, they enhance the operations of our brain because they have uh, neurotransmitting chemicals in them. Mm. And this has only been known, you know, recently. I mean, it's been known by shamans for thousands of years, but science has only known recently that there are about 200 kinds of plants, including uh, psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, iboga, things like that, Right. that give, that have uh, psychomimetic properties. They don't impose anything on our psyche. They just crank up the operation of the mind and the psyche to an extraordinary level. Mm -hmm. And I believe that those plants, the entheogens, have been provided by Gaia to teach us how to follow her designs and how to live and survive over the long term. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are so important, and that's why entheogens are such a central message in in my work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And that's, I guess, also why many... uh you know, controlling agents of this planet now are trying to uh, make plants make it illegal. illegal. To eat fresh sure, mushrooms. sure, yeah, exactly. Do you know that there is a toad? Do you know about toad licking? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, there's bufotenic acid on toads, right? And if you lick the toad, you can get a, uh, you can go into an altered state, right? Yeah, yeah. In it is known in the United States. This, this is going to blow you away. It's known in the United States that the Colorado River toad which lives in the area of the Colorado River, it's quite rare, as highly hallucinogenic. It's a, uh, if you lick the back of that toad, you will get high. You will go into an altered state. Well, it is now illegal to own a Colorado River toad. There we go. Nice. Oh, my God. Well, wait, or you just hold on there because they're going to genetically modify that toad, so we don't even have to worry about that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh they're going to make a better toad out yeah, of that toad. Of course. Yeah, and you know, in Amsterdam, uh, where I frequently used to go to the smart shops to buy dried mushrooms, well, then dried mushrooms were made illegal and put on the same level as Class A drug cocaine, which is totally insane. Hmm. There is no clinical evidence and scientific evidence that psychedelic mushrooms produce damage on the level of cocaine or alcohol. Hmm. None whatsoever. Hmm. Now, they're, of course, ban- they're banning fresh mushrooms. Really? Yeah, they are. In, yep, in a, they're banning. They're making it illegal to sell fresh mushrooms in Holland now. They do, okay. and mm. you are absolutely right. You see, the one greatest threat to the authorities, and this is what I'm writing about right now on the Meta History site. This is my current material, my current project. Mm-hmm. The one greatest threat to the authorities is that we should have free access to the plants nature gives us to enlighten us. Right. Because then we will be onto the game. Then we will see we're being controlled, deceived, and manipulated. And so these plants, which just grow in nature, are going to be for systematically forbidden to us. Mm. And there is a battle. There is a battle taking place there. John, we would love to have you back on the program here uh, 
at some point, and, and maybe we could, this would be a perfect topic actually to dive in further into the ent- entheogens and see, you know, what, what is good, what is not, and so forth, and, and explore that a little while. I would be delighted to do that, Henrik, and also it gives me the opportunity to speak about those things in a way that is sober and clear and well-balanced. Exactly. Because, uh, I think that it's an extremely important subject, and it should not be discussed in a, in a fanatical or imbalanced way. Right. And I'd love the opportunity to go into it with you Excellent. when that's appropriate. Yeah, perfect. You know, again, I want to thank you so much for a fantastic uh, you know, interview. This has been a f- you know, fabulous program. Awesome. And I want to leave the last few minutes here again to you so you can mention your website again, uh, your latest book, but also mention the, the, the earlier books that you have out there. Uh, I'm not familiar with, uh, with too many of them. Mention them for us. Well, my first book was called The Seeker's Handbook. It came out in 1991, and it's kind of a general guide to alternative spirituality. Uh, After that, I wrote two books uh, on comparative mythology. One is called Twins and the Double, and and the other one is called The Hero. Then I wrote, in 1999, my uh, main work on the star zodiac and the constellations of the sky, which is called Quest for the Zodiac. And my most recent book is this book on Gnosticism, which is called Not in His Image. That came out in November of, of 2006. I just want to mention, too, Henrik, that in, in addition to the metahistory.org site, mm-hmm. there's a sister site called futureprimitive.org, oh. mm-hmm. which you can get to from the home page of, of metahistory. And it has interviews. It's all interviews with fantastic people. And there are some interviews with me on there regarding the subjects we've been discussing. Nice, excellent. So, metahistory.org and futureprimitive.org. Okay, excellent. Again, John, thank you so much for coming on. A true pleasure having you on. Thank you so much, and we'll be continue to be in touch. It's been a real pleasure.